uh, you know, on the heels of this very important speech. Now, if, if it weren't for President Biden's the U.S. curb on uh, China when it comes to chips, so important to developing key things that they need to develop, um, maybe this wouldn't be resonating so much. But against that backdrop, how strident, how aggressive, what, what, is, what is Xi Jinping trying to tell not just the world, but in particular the U.S.? Yeah, I think you're absolutely right. Uh, thanks for having me back on, I should say. But look, this, this speech is taking place in context, and the context is a deterioration in U.S.-China relations, especially trade relations. And President Biden has imposed uh, export bans on technology and chip technology to China. So this is a reassuring message from Xi, or an attempt to be reassuring to his constituencies to say, we're going to plow ahead on our own. We're going to devote the resources and effort on our own to close that gap and to make up for whatever shortfall there might be in this uh, ban from the United States. You know, another uh, key issue here is the, uh, the his, his Taiwan reunification. Uh, Shuli Ren, who is uh, a Mandarin speaker, made the point that in this part of the speech, he really picked up, that his voice even shook at one time, that he is angry about this. What did you pick up? Um, look, I, Taiwan is the most important domestic political issue in China. It uh, is obligatory for anybody who aspires to senior leadership in the Chinese Communist Party to be forceful, if not strident, on Taiwan. So part of what she is doing is passing a test. But I wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't allocate all of the interpretation of this to simply domestic Chinese politics. I think they are also serious about this, that they don't want to see any change in the status of Taiwan. They don't want to see a move toward independence. They want to caution the United States about fomenting or incentivizing independent streak in Taiwan. So they're serious about trying to manage it on their terms in the near future. Frank, at the same time, we're seeing their mode of domestic governance, COVID zero, uh, the other aspects of how this is playing out for the economy, the property sector, consumer demand being depressed. All of this is starting to constrain growth. You see this in the trade numbers. I mean, we just had the Singapore export numbers when it comes to demand from China shrinking over 30 percent for September. What does that mean for businesses in, in your area and how, I guess, China is reshaped in terms of whether or not it can continue being the economic uh, powerhouse for both demand and supply? I, I think the uh, zero tolerance uh, policy in China, the lockdown policies in China, have caused considerable disruption to the Chinese economy. Now, the, uh, Beijing will say the, the benefit is worth it. There's, there's health benefits to it. But to my mind, they could have, I think, accomplished a lot of the benefits of that without these sort of massive and pervasive and dislocating uh, lockdowns. And I think the ripple effect is going to go on for some time. So I think they really went for a very rigid or very orthodox approach on COVID. They're paying a huge economic price for it. And they're not going to be able to easily turn the light switch back on next year, having turned it off this year. So it, it's a longer term problem for the Chinese economy. What are you seeing from a business perspective for, for your business in, well, in terms yeah, I, of I can tell you specifically, that demand and activity? Sure, I can tell you specifically in e-commerce, you, you have a collapse in demand in certain segments like apparel and beauty. Beauty and apparel are typically the two largest segments of consumer goods in China e-commerce. And of course, when you have lockdown, you don't need a new shirt or you don't need a new skin cream. So demand just mm. collapses in those areas. It also disrupts work habits and office activity and experimentation. So it's a it has a depressive effect in the whole economy. So uh, in terms of the uh, the next steps for China. What is at the top of the list? If many people are saying, for example, that COVID zero may not be going away for a long, long time. Uh, although some thought that maybe after the Party Congress, that's when she would be able to say, "Okay, we're, we're doing better. We, we can we can start softening this, start winding it down." What do you think is the next big step from I, Xi Jinping? I, I, I'm in that second group. I think the point of the Party Congress is it, it, this is consistent with Chinese political culture. He's not there to be defense or to apologize, his message at the Party Congress is, we did the right things for the right reasons. We took the right steps to safeguard China's health. So it is a, 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 almost a defiant 
or a resolute posture that he's taking, and, and it's accepted and amplified by the party structure. That's for today. But my guess is when we get through the holidays, we start looking at January, we will see some lightning or some experimentation. We'll see, I think, a reduction in quarantine for international visits. And I think we'll see a lighter touch when it comes to lockdowns and a slight move away from that zero tolerance. But Chinese government tends to move incrementally, and I don't think they move until next year.